When all was ready, Hannibal gave the signal to release the barges. The Gauls, startled by his boldness, were mystified when they saw the Carthaginian general leading his troops, cavalry, and elephants en masse across the turbulent Rhone. When he arrived at the river's opposite bank, the Gauls broke in panic and fled without striking a blow. The entire operation took a little more than nine days. I think the crossing of the Rhone in such a short space of time using rudimentary equipment is one of the great achievements of military history. And people slightly forget the small engineering miracles that made all this possible. Hannibal and his army continued on and made their way to the foot of the Alps. With winter looming, the troops were starving and exhausted. As they ascended, they confronted another seemingly impossible obstacle giant boulders. Hannibal's engineers devise a plan that would allow the troops not just to go over, but through. The stratagem of crossing the Alps certainly shocked the people of Italy. No one expected an army with elephants to make it across. And although the Alps may have seemed in places impassable, this idea of breaking up the mountains themselves to create a pathway to get your pachyderms across uh, was a brilliant idea. Now, how did Hannibal get his men, not to mention all those elephants, up, over, around, or through these giant boulders? Well, according to the Roman historian Livy, he came up with an ingenious plan along with his engineers that would literally move mountains. They cut big crevices through these boulders, and then they got wood from the surrounding forest. They'd wrap these boulders in the wood, and when the wind was right, they'd torch the wood. The rocks would heat up, and just when they were hot enough, they'd pour boiling vinegar into the crevices, which would shatter or melt the rocks such that these men could break them apart with iron implements. Now, what was Hannibal doing up in the Alps with all this vinegar? Well, if this is true, and we like to think it was, otherwise, how did he get across the Alps? It speaks volumes to the genius of this brilliant general. I'll tell you one thing. After navigating the snow of the Alps, the sight of the plains of northern Italy must have been very, very welcome. On August 2nd, 216 BC, near Cannae in southern Italy, Hannibal faced off against Roman forces under the command of Terentius Varro in a decisive conflict that would seal the fate of these two empires. As dawn breaks, Hannibal draws up a force of 50,000 men, newly strengthened with the help of hired mercenaries, against Varro's nearly 90,000 Romans. Varro decided to try and crush his opponent, sending a massive force to attack Hannibal's center. This would prove to be a fatal mistake. Anticipating Varro's strategy, Hannibal orders his cavalry to circumvent the Roman ranks from the rear. Hannibal had certainly done his homework in studying the psychology of his opponents. And he was able to trick them into his center, and then his forces could engulf them. Completely surrounded, the Romans were slaughtered where they stood. Only 3,500 Romans managed to escape. 10,000 were taken prisoner, and 70,000 were left dead on the battlefield. At the Battle of Cannae, the single greatest defeat ever inflicted on a Roman army throughout its entire history. And of course, we have to go to World War I to find a scale of slaughter as big. Cannae was a masterpiece of military strategy, but Hannibal was unable to capitalize on his string of victories. He fought on for another 13 years, mounting siege after siege on Rome and its surrounding cities. But ultimate victory remained elusive. He could defeat them in the field, but he lacked the proper weapons to take on the Roman capital. In 204 BC, Rome went on the offensive and launched an attack on Carthage. Hannibal finally returned home to muster its defense. 
In 204 BC, Scipio Africanus, who had already beaten the Carthaginians in Spain, convinced Rome to let him go around Hannibal altogether and attack Carthage directly. Hannibal was recalled to his city to defend it. Now, these two heavyweights met and spoke. We have no idea what they said to one another. It's lost to history. In 202 BC, they met again at the Battle of Zama. And Hannibal was defeated. And he was forced to surrender to an enemy that he'd spent his entire life trying to destroy. He would not fulfill his father's wishes. He was exiled from Carthage. And years later, in your present day Turkey, he committed suicide. Carthage's defeat at the end of the Second Punic War forces the empire to submit yet again to Roman terms. They are forced to surrender in 202 BC. The Romans again impose very harsh peace terms on the Carthaginians, meaning, first of all, they must again pay an indemnity, a tax to the Romans. Also, the Carthaginians lose their overseas territories, meaning their territory is now confined to areas just around Carthage itself. One last very important part of this treaty was that Carthage could not fight a war, any war, even a defensive war, without Rome's okay. With Carthage stripped of its military might, the field was now open for the Roman army to begin its unstoppable conquest of the ancient world. And their first major target would be the wounded city of Carthage. All that stood in the way was the ancient world's strongest fortifications. Hannibal ad portas, which translates to Hannibal is at the gates, was often used after the Second Punic War to scare children to bed.